Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. The Lord be with you. Holy, gracious, eternal, and loving God, on this day we give you thanks and praise and ask indeed that you will allow your word to speak deep into our hearts. Indeed, allow us to hear your call for us to trust and help us to daringly and boldly do just that. As the witnesses of the Scriptures have have proclaimed to us, so may we show this now to the world. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this morning, let's start the sermon with a simple question. Where do you lift your eyes to? We heard this just a moment ago in the sermon, I mean the, uh, the psalm. Beautifully done today, by the way, as usual. But this beautiful Psalm 123 Asking the question, the psalmist is begging, who do you lift your eyes to? Now, that may sound like an odd question. It may sound a little out of sorts for us, but it's one that the psalmist invites us to consider nonetheless. Psalm 123 is a really brief psalm. If you noticed, we only had two sections, versicles for us to take and be working on today. It's a really short psalm, only a couple verses, but it's a psalm that was called a psalm of ascent. It means it was a psalm that was used by the people, not an individual, but by the people as they were going up to Jerusalem. It was a song that they would sing together in preparation for being in the holy city and specifically being at the temple that place where they understood that God dwelled on earth. It was a song of preparation for them to be in God's presence in worship. 
Now, it also fits very nicely in what scholars understand as how a psalm of ascent works. A psalm of ascent often has a complaint and then a statement of trust. So here's the complaint. It's the latter part of the psalm, the second half of the psalm, and it's complaining about the contempt and the scorn from those who are rich. It's about being derided by people who seemingly are proud. It's about a feeling of shame, of being made to feel less than, being put in our lower place by someone who thinks that they're higher. So the complaint is they're dealing with that feeling like the world is looking at them in a not-so-nice way. But the other part of the psalm is that expression of trust, and that's where it's at the beginning, it's talking about lifting their eyes, and it's a together, it's not the individual, but together as community, lifting their eyes to God, looking to God's power and mercy and grace and love and compassion, looking to God's calling for what the world is truly meant to be, even in the midst of their own anxieties, in the midst of their own suffering, their own uncomfortableness, looking to God. Now, I don't know about you, but frequently it seems that when we're going through something difficult, it's a little hard to look beyond ourselves. You know, I was out mowing on Friday morning. I thought I'd be smart, get it done before all the rain and all. Do you know how many mosquitoes are out on Friday morning? <laughs> I was in shorts. I didn't prepare. And, oh my golly, the number of mosquito bites. And then yesterday... Do you know what happened next? They all itched at the same time. <laughs> and I'm in the midst of my plight of mosquito bites. And it's a little hard to think about much else when you're wanting to continually be scratching your leg. It's easy in the midst of our suffering and when we feel challenged and we feel like our world is shaking apart to be so consumed in it that we can't raise our eyes. Yet the psalmist is inviting us and God calls us to raise our eyes to God, to trust God even in the midst of our uncertainty. I invite you for a moment to recognize the wisdom of those who place this window this massive window above the altar, because if you look at it, it draws your eyes to an image of Christ calling us to raise our eyes, lift our eyes, to look to God in all circumstances of life. Now, this little psalm, I think, is a gift for us on the 245th birthday of our nation as we are celebrating, reveling in, enjoying, giving thanks to God for our wonderful nation, I think this psalm is a gift. This psalm, in fact, invites us to how we should live as a nation and as citizens of this nation. Now, just think for a moment all that our nation has been through. 245 years ago, it was an onslaught of battle to overcome loosing the reins of a king over on another continent, let alone on a big island on another continent, getting free from England and then the British control. Then came the struggling to figure out words words that would refine and define and explain how does this new entity, nation, exist? How will it operate? Laying a new foundation for a new way of being. And then struggling even harder 
to parse out these words over decades and centuries. Our founding fathers certainly were writing these words down before the internet, before social media, before cars, planes, radios, and so much more. It's a continuing journey of striving for the best that we can be as a nation. We have gone to war, gone to war to expand the nation, to defend the nation, and to preserve the nation. We have struggled with issues of the Bill of Rights and who actually is given rights and what that looks like. We have lived through the repulsive era of slavery. We've lived through the struggles and continue with the struggles for women's rights and so much more. Our nation has persevered for 245 years on a course to secure the rights of all inhabitants and to further the freedoms of others. And through this journey of time and struggle, we have often been divided as a nation, challenged. At times, the bully voices of the indolent rich and the derision of the proud have been loud and demanding. Yet for people of faith, for Christians, as we live in this amazing nation, the priority remains the same. We lift our eyes to the Lord. We lift our eyes to God. In his treatise on good works in the year 1520, Martin Luther discusses that the primary good work for a Christian is to trust God, faith. Faith, which is a gift of God, is our first and foremost work. And through that one work, all other things we do are defined and refined. Faith is that trust in God above all else. Faith is lifting our eyes to God in spite of what we may see around us, in spite of what we may feel. Oftentimes we react to feelings without much rationality. Yet we're called to look to God first in all things. We focus on God and live according to God's will, God's way. We focus our lives to follow the ministry of Jesus. Now, we heard the gospel reading, and if you want to see how Jesus was received, he wasn't always received well. Even in his hometown, they were skeptical about him. Yet you notice in that story, he did not shake the dust off of his heels in his hometown, and he still healed some people. That's the nature of our God, who still doesn't give up on us, and who continues even to do great things in spite of us sometimes. I believe that what our nation needs is for us to lift our eyes together to God. Now, I would suspect that some will hear that and immediately want to say, I, and we're not in a Baptist church, and sometimes I rue that because Baptists at least get into it and you know you're connecting with them. Somebody would shout out, Amen! It'd be nice. So you're allowed to now and then if you so desire. But I would invite us to a point of caution at the same time. Because I'm imagining that right now there are right and left wing, wing thinkers who are loudly saying yes at the same time while they villainize anyone who thinks differently from them. You see, the right wing and the left wing think they own God. They think they're both justified in God. I'm inviting us to what the psalmist gives us the third way. Together, together, 
Let's raise our eyes to God. Let us look together to the God who loves us and does not give up on us. We so easily can set our eyes on other things. Sometimes they're shiny things that distract us, or sometimes they're simply things that we prefer by our own opinions. What happens when we together, young, old, male, female, Republican, Democratic, whatever, whatever, together raise our eyes to God, to trusting God first and foremost. The psalmist is inviting us to that, to focus together on God's goodness and grace, on God's compassion and mercy, on God's way of servanthood, to dare to see where God's Holy Spirit is nudging and leading us When we as a nation together lift our eyes to the Lord, then there is hope for our nation to be all that it can be, that we can live up to the best of our ideals, the best of our hopes. When we together lift our eyes to the Lord, we can see together the mercy of God and the hope of salvation for all people. When we together turn our eyes away from ourselves and or our interest and or our opinions to seek God, we have hope for what can yet be. Too often we humans try to take the shortcut. It's kind of, you know, one of my first lessons in chemistry was Dr. Eckert at Capital University who wanted to talk about order and disorder, and he simply threw a bunch of papers up in the air, and he said they have a natural way of coming down. It's called disorder. That's the majority way that we will go. So often that's just the way we'll go. We'll take the easy route instead of the harder route of organizing together, of walking together, seeking God's way in the world. Focus on God's goodness. Focus on God's faithfulness. Focus on Christ who has led the way. Together let us go there. To focus on God's mercy and goodness, God's compassion and grace, God's abundance and blessing will lead us someplace. As long as we don't follow that route, We won't get there together. Where is God going to lead our nation? Perhaps the places that we have not yet imagined, perhaps to joys that we have not even sensed possible. Sisters and brothers, on this 4th of July, let us from every part of our rich diversity, our rich makeup of people, our rich variety, let us together lift our eyes to the Lord, trusting God, and just see where God will take us. Amen.